Hello and welcome. The Russian offensive seems to be petering out slowly while Russian military bloggers and Prigozhin himself are increasingly voicing their fear for a coming Ukrainian offensive. This and more in the Situation Report. Ukraine has been attacked with 16 Shahid-136 drones on the 17th of March. Ukraine is saying they shot down 11 of the 16, so five were still coming through. Americans have now said something about the incident with the MQ-9 Reaper. They said the Russians wanted to send a message, but, on, uh, but the incident happened the way it did because their pilots are inept and don't know how to fly properly. Whether that's true or not is one thing, but uh, I guess you could call this some kind of diss towards the Russians that is um, like a, um, a return of the favor without ballistic mis without um, ballistic means, without destroying anything. At least when it comes to the PR, I think uh, this, to my mind, sounds more funny than getting some Russian drone to, to go down in return as a response to that. While Xi Jinping has now arrived in Russia, at the same time it's getting um, public that Chinese workers in a Central African Republic gold mine have been slaughtered. The Right now it's unclear who was it, the government of the Central African Republic, which is a coup d'etat, which had a coup d'etat, so it's a military junta, that one is saying the rebels did it, while the rebels say Wagner mercenaries have actually slaughtered the Chinese workers. So as of now, it's obviously unclear who is to blame for that. On the Eastern Front, north of the Sivyevsky Donetsk, we have further reports about Russian attacks. The Russians are claiming they advanced somewhere here in the direct close direction, close proximity of Dvorichina. They said they pushed the Ukrainians over the Oskil. There's no confirmation whatsoever that they achieved anything here. Uh, other than that, there are, the Ukrainians are saying heavy attacks in the direction of Torske, which is here, and close to Krimina, but we have not seen any significant change in the of, of possession of territory in this region anywhere in the last few weeks. South of the Sivyevsky Donetsk, heavy attacks on Bilohurivna are continuing. The Russians keep pushing towards this, this town, which is part of Luhansk Oblast, but as of now, it's still held by the Ukrainians. Other than that, around uh, the fighting is obviously massive around Bakhmut. We have reports of further, further fighting at Urikhovo Vasilivka here and the, that there are some Russian attacks in the direction of Rihurivka in this direction here. Uh, in, e in either case, can I confirm that they actually gained some territory? Russian military bloggers are saying are talking about Ukrainian counterattacks in uh, Khomove and Bodanivka, so more or less along that line here, that line of communication that they are trying to push the Russians back. Russians have possibly gained some ground in the direction of Bodanivka over the last two days. Um, I cannot fully confirm it, but it seems that they have advanced closer. So whether this line of communication is actually still usable is up for the question. So is unconfirmed. In Bakhmut itself, the fighting is continuing in the north, especially around the Assom complex, that industrial area here. The Russians are saying they are clearing the area from Ukrainians, so supposedly Ukrainians are still in Assom, uh, somewhere uh, around that at least, but uh, it seems like the Russians are keeping up the pressure and probably advancing. The Russians are also claiming further advances from the south, and they claim that somewhere in the center they actually crossed the Bakhmutivka river, but I cannot confirm either of that. There are no, uh, no, there is no proof whatsoever in this regard. Other than that, we have fighting close to Ivanivske. Russian attacks here, but uh, no confirmation that they ha have advanced anywhere. And in we have something here from Telegram that is a video of a Ukrainian column and supposedly south southeast of Konstanty Konstantinovka, Tino, whatever Konstantinovka. Konstantinovka, and this is a pro-Russian military blogger, as you can clearly see with the Z at the end here, and he says it's not accidental. Uh, it's likely that there's going to be a counterattack here, but it might not be uh, uh, the main 
drive it might just be to draw in more Ukraine, more uh, to draw in the attention so supposedly that was somewhere taken here fairly close and there are reports that the um, Ukrainians are likely going to counterattack in this area here continuously. There have been recent counterattacks in this area. I can't show the video proof because it's full of bodies that um, so. I, I can't show the, you the video, but there's definitely fighting going on. And in general, there have seemed to have been a couple of Ukrainian counterattacks in the region. Some have gained some territory, but as, as it seems now, nothing decisive as of yet. Further south, we have heavy fighting around Avdivka. The Russians are attacking at Kamyanka, at Siverne, at Pervomaiske and at Nev Nevelske. So more or less in that area, they're still still trying either to envelop Avdivka or continue a turning maneuver. But as of now, they are not really advancing anywhere. In Marinka, the fighting is also reported. Continuous fighting there, but no change in possession that I can prove of. And I have actually not heard about Russian attacks close to Vulida over the last two days. Along the southern front, the Ukrainians are saying the... Artillery fire over the Dnipro is dying down, it's getting lower. Um, now, this is speculation, but it might be that the Russians are redeploying either artillery units or that they are allotting less ammunition to conserve it to use in other regions. But at least we see that the artillery fire is going down, even though the Ukrainians are trying an intensive counter-battery counter fire along the Dnipro, which might also have some contribution to the reduction in artillery fire. Um, other than that, no fresh reports of fighting along the southern front line, but we have some new pictures of additional fortifications, both in the, um, basically at the Crimean area. We see here um, wood that is being collected here, and the, the fortifications supposedly are here, which should be, uh -oh, let me just check. So it's somewhere in here, here on this area is fortification continuing and we have further images here of Russians that are, um, that are also hiring contractors to continue fortification work on the Crimean uh, Peninsula. What we can see here is obviously that they are uh, trying to apparently put roofs over the the trench lines that is likely for not just uh, make them more livable but also to allow for ca better camouflage a protection against um, air dropped munitions shouldn't be viable with the material material we see here unless of course they add, start adding massive earthworks on top but whether the, this construction and that sheet metal here is strong enough is obviously a different question here we see some concrete work that is being done and as i said like the the whole a thread is talking about examples. We see uh, basically job offers to work on that. An interesting part is the fortification work is so serious that Russian companies have started prefabrication of wooden shells, you might say, so that the of wooden work uh, that so that the Russian side only has to dig it out and then put those wooden frames in which even allow for some drainage at the bottom bottom to to have water uh, to allow drainage to to allow the water to be removed if it's not fully set in obviously it could they could also try to to stick it fully into the ground which doesn't isn't really needed though as those as those frames should be more more or less fixed in the ground anyway so you don't really need to anchor them in the ground with those long pillars so it's at least it, to me it seems that this is meant to allow for at least some drainage under it nevertheless this is pure speculation but nevertheless uh, it shows that the russians are taking it serious to fortify the crimea this work here is mostly concentrated on the perikop isthmus so this area here which is a uh, tiny uh, I think four kilometers wide, where basically the Ukrainians will have to push through to conquer Crimea. And we see that the Russian, that the Russians take it serious enough 
for to to expect that the ukrainians might come down there to put actually put resources into that and a fair amount of those uh, all of this together with the reduction in russian attacks at several areas and with the fact that the gain in territory is really really slowed down even further over the last few days it, it's more and more an indication that the culmination of the russian offensive is uh, to be expected soon that doesn't necessarily mean Bakhmut is saved. They might still break through and uh, completely encircle Bakhmut here. But as of now, the the Russian spring or winter offensive seems to be closely seems to be slowly coming to an end. When it comes to partisans, there was the commander of a unit, um, I guess a police unit of the Interior Ministry, that was killed in occupied Kherson Oblast. And we have reports about the mobilization as well. There's a German journalist still in Russia, Christoph Wanner, and in, in a segment with the Welt, his employer, he said that he actually thinks that the numbers Prigozhin is saying about recruitment of Wagner are realistic as Wagner is paying well. So we have somebody in Russia who speaks Russian who claims that Prigozhin's claims of recruiting up to 1,200 men per day might not be completely fabricated. Um, we'll have to observe whether that's actually the solution for Wagner um, to, to solve its manpower issues. Manpower issues, though, are a continuous problem. We have a report here from the BBC that uh, by now 17,375 Russian fallen have unmistakably identified. This doesn't mean it's only 17,375. It means that they could identify by name, the rank, picture, etc., a specific that specific number of fallen Russian servicemen in uh, by by. Um, by public announcement and things like this. This specifically does not include fighters from the DNR and the LNR, the so-called People's Republics. And in the last two weeks, they could identify 1,304 fallen, while usually it was 250 to 300. So the it seems like there's an uptick, a massive uptick in Russian uh, losses right now and their their cautious estimation is that there's a, there's at least 35,000 fallen without the DNR and the LNR as they expect it to be at least twice as much as they have by cross-referencing other data and in total they expect that the Russian losses without the DNR and the LNR are at least 157,000 by killed uh, in wounded to the degree of turning invalid and by missing uh, russia supposedly has more or less at least lost 160,000 men the british ministry of defense has now a a um, explanation why the why the recruitment age might have been lifted to 21 and that is that the majority of the russian students are at university from 18 to 21 so this would reduce the number of uh, students of, of young men that can avoid conscription by going to university, which exempts from recru recruiting. If the the lower recruitment age is when the majority has left university, then they are obviously fully available to be recruited as well. In the political sphere, Prigozhin fa still faces pressure. Um, several local governments seems to be seem to cut their political ties with him. In several locations his there they have now banned the burying of wagner fighters for various reasons and in krasnodar the government the local government seems to have ended its cooperation with wagner which was uh, before a fair pillar of support for the wagner uh, fighters support though is still coming from other regards the european union will but not for russia you European Union wants to uh, acquire artillery ammunition for Ukraine worth 2 billion euros. Unfortunately, there are reports, though, that France is slowing down the initiative because it wants to make sure that the production is within the European Union and that the ammo isn't bought from abroad. Northern Macedonia has confirmed that four of its Sukhoi-25 um, uh, combat air support plane its ground attackers are have given have been given to ukraine three of them were single seaters and one is a su 25 ub double seater so both capable of fighting but the double seater 
could be used for training as well and they say they were not airworthy so either ukraine will have to repair them or they will have to cannibalize them also they will deliver mi 24 hind attack helicopters about the state of whether or not those are airworthy i cannot say anything norway has handed over eight leopard 2 a force four raves so armored recovery vehicles that could help um, salvage uh, leopard 2 that is only damaged and make sure it doesn't have to be destroyed or is not going to be captured by the russians and they also handed over one counter battery radar which will help the ukrainians fight russian artillery and we have a report here of the new uh, security assistance for Ukraine and among the usual artillery round we have some interesting things we have again a lot of harms the high-speed anti-radiation missiles that Ukraine can use to suppress Russian air defense systems and we also have demolition munitions and equipment for obstacle clearing as well as mine clearing equipment so some of those items seem to be aimed at allowing a Ukrainian counteroffensive, or at least make it make it more possible, make it easier in this regard. From the German side, we have the report from the defense minister that the German Marda ones are already on their way into Ukraine, so the promised Marda IFVs should be available for a potential coming uh, Ukrainian counteroffensive as well, which is to be expected to start within the next few weeks. And finally, we have something weird, um, but at the same time funny. It shows how disorganized uh, Ukraine can be as well. This is a Ukrainian soldier and he's getting a phone call where the military commissariat is asking him yeah. why he's hiding from the, from the recruitment. Um, from being called up uh, while in the background you can hear artillery fire because he's in a in a trench close to Bakhmut. So the the military commissariat thought he's avoiding mobilization while he's actually already in the front line. This might be funny at first, but it obviously is a sign for the disorganization. And it's not really a sign for long training that has happened um, for massive training. So that guy surely wasn't for three months in training before ending up in a trench line. And that would be in accordance to what we have here from the Washington Post, that Kupol, who gave an interview to the Washington Post about how weak um, soldiers, how badly his soldiers are trained, a former lieutenant colonel supposedly has been demoted and removed from his job because he gave an interview without permission, um, where he basically said that the the personnel he receives now often doesn't even know how to handle weapons or to throw a grenade and that many of them start running the first time they're facing Russian soldiers. Um, obviously nothing positive to say but one thing that still has to be said because he said himself that he aimed uh, to wake up his country to and, and the international community to allow for more international training as obviously Ukraine is far beyond its regular reserves by now when it comes to the mobilization so people are being called up that have might have served decades ago or that have never served and uh, that can it seems like they are being pushed into the front lines far too fast and if it which as this will not just hamper the ukrainian abilities but also incre increase the loss rate this is something worth discussing even though it's unpleasant and it's not it's not being uh, really fitting into the framing of the superior ukrainian quality in soldiers he mentioned how high the losses in his units has been and apparently he's being punished for that but the article says that he has political supporters who say that what he did was right like even members of parliament so we'll have to see what happens out of here but it fits perfectly what we can see here because we can imagine that somebody who was trained for three or six months maybe even longer uh, shouldn't get a phone call like this it seems more likely that you get a phone call like this if you were supposed to appear a month ago six weeks ago so not a good sign in this regard nevertheless um, that was it already for today as we can see the fighting is dying down somewhat before the expected Ukrainian counteroffensive, it seems the Russian culmination is pretty close. Not too much happening exactly. That doesn't mean the losses aren't severe. Obviously, the fighting in Bakhmut will likely claim several hundred lives per day. But 
when it comes to the control on the ground, there's not that much to say right now because the front lines are really moving slowly as of now. As said, this was it for me for now. If you enjoyed this, if you enjoy this content, um, hit the thumbs up button. It really helps with the algorithm. Leave a comment for the algorithm as well. If you're new here, I would like to invite you to hit the subscribe button and um, click the bell icon so you don't miss future videos and this channel is only possible because of the support from viewers like you so if you like to support the channel you can do so by the means in the description thank you very much to everyone already supporting the channel that's it from me for now thank you for watching and i'll be back